Uh, hi guys, my name is uh, Abdurrahman. Most people call me AR. Um, so yeah, this is uh, I'm the I run a small music blog, a music and culture blog called uh, Mosiki. Um, it's still in its early infant stages, like Mazarat as well. But um, it's basically <coughs> a, a collection, a place for alternative Pakistani music and alternative Pakistani culture, meaning stuff that is not presented in the mainstream and stuff that is um, slightly underground. So I'll just tell you guys a bit about how I, how and why I started the. Um, the platform. Uh, I was living. Oh, thanks. Uh, I was living in London. Uh, for, I was working in London for two years. Um, I've grown up most of my life in England. Actually, I was born in Pakistan, but then I uh, moved to Pakistan, uh, England when I was quite young. And um, I was working in London for two years, and I was sort of very distant from Pakistani culture generally. The only thing I knew about Pakistani music was really Coke Studio. Um, but I was very into <coughs> uh, European music and Western American music. And I would always read a, a magazine called Pitchfork Magazine. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It was started in Chicago in around 1995. And it's a very small, it started as a very small music magazine that would just publish album reviews from these small indie bands that were coming up in Chicago. Um, and now it's grown into like a huge, big, uh, like corporate magazine that's been owned by Condé Nast and stuff like this. So now it's a much bigger thing. Like, and while I was in London, I was browsing the website like I usually did every week, and I saw this article that popped up on my feed, which was searching for an underground generation in Karachi, Pakistan. And I was never expecting to see anything like this <coughs> on on this magazine that I would go on like every day. So um, yeah, immediately I I clicked on it, and it was a it was a photo essay by uh, Tonje Thielsen, who I think is a Norwegian uh, photographer. And um, she had basically gone to Karachi whilst, I think she was there while Sabine Mahmood was still alive from um, T2F. <coughs> and she was photographing all the underground electronic musicians that were coming up in Karachi. And one of the lines from the, this photo essay is that the music coming out of these labels is challenging and diverse. Their very existence doubles as a potent political act. Um, in other words, she what she was seeing uh, was music that was also political in its you know creation. It wasn't just music; it was something else. There was a commentary to it as well. Um, these are just some of the pictures from her photo essay. Uh, all the credit, of course, goes to to her. This is Slow Spin. Uh, she's an electronic uh, music producer in Karachi. Really, really cool stuff ambient textures but she uses like harmonicas and stuff and she um, alters them in like she's a bedroom producer as well a lot of these guys are just bedroom producers they just make music in very small spaces in their bedrooms and then put it out online this is Hamid Rahim uh, also known as Dynaman he made an amazing <clears throat> debut album with uh, again a lot of desi elements in it tablas, sitars, all these kind of different samples but with an electronic feel oh sorry uh, Aileen Pandajuri at his home, another Karachi musician. Sana Nasser, she's a, um, she's a uh, graphic designer who's worked on a lot of festival work and uh, um, yeah, really interesting visual artist. This is Daniel Arthur, uh, sorry, uh, Daniel Hayat, uh, Rohail Hayat's son from Coke Studio, but he's also a very interesting uh, electronic musician. The film that's coming out recently, I think if any of you guys have heard of it, Lal Kabutar, he's doing the soundtrack for that as well. So all these guys are doing really amazing, interesting stuff. I thought I'd just like some of the first stuff that I heard from this article. Because after this photo essay, at the bottom she posted a SoundCloud playlist um, that I obviously then clicked on. And like I said, the only thing I'd heard from, the, from Pakistan was really Coke Studio and a few of these branded big corporate music shows. So my experience when I first heard this music was I was blown away. I didn't know that people were making this kind of thing in Pakistan. Um, I looked online and I tried to find a place where I could find more of this kind of music, more of this, uh, more of this stuff. And I think Dawn had covered it, Tribune had covered it, but it, there wasn't a, a specific place where I could find all of this stuff. There wasn't just one collection of where I could, like Pitchfork magazine, where I could go and see like, what do people think of this music or what do... Um, What's going on in Karachi right now with these musicians? 
So yeah, that was w w where the idea for Mosiki came from, was from this article, because uh, uh, I felt like it'd be cool if there was something similar like that in Pakistan. So I made the logo just a random uh, typeface. I paid for the website domain while I was still in London. Uh, and then I made the Facebook and an, and an Instagram page. And then the later, I made a, a YouTube page. So yeah, that's the, the basic inception. Um, but my second, after my second year in London, I decided to quit my job and then move back over here. And I was expecting to go back. Uh, back to London, back and find a, if I could find another job. But uh, I managed to get a job at Mango Buzz here, um, where I was their video producer for about two years. So working at Mango Buzz was obviously, I, I, I still do work there, I work there part time. Like, and it was a really interesting experience, and I learned a huge amount about content creation and how to, uh, how to make stuff that people might be interested in watching and how to edit things in this new social media age where the, like you said, yeah, I said, the attention span is so short that you have to really get people into the content as quickly as possible. So yeah, I learned a lot from Mango Bars and I've used some of those techniques and some of those um, editing elements to, in, in the Mosiki work as well. Um, as, in terms of what the audience is and what the general idea behind Mosiki is, I guess it would just be the world word alternative. Um, to present people with uh, another possibility or choice and just say that this is something that is available to you. Um, that we don't always just have to listen to corporate branded shows like Pepsi or Coke or Nescafe or Conetto or whatever biscuit brand is coming into music now. That there, is, there are people making music all the time and they have been making music and this is something that we can listen to and we can be interested in. Uh, and it's not just music, right? It's movies, uh, short films, poetry, um, all this kind of stuff. This is all, this all exists and it's possible. Um, and again, going back to that same quote, right? The, the music coming out of these labels is challenging, diverse. Their very existence doubles as a potent political act. Um, a lot of people have, been, have talked to me about uh, Mosiki as, uh, why don't you just stick to music? Why are you doing culture? Why are you doing politics? Like in, for me, I think the, I always see music as something that is inherently political in and of itself. Um, punk music in the 60s in, in, um, in New York was very, a very political thing. Um, and I kind of see the same thing happening here, which is that music is not just something that is separate from politics, it is politics, it has politics in it. So in order to be able to discuss music, you have to be able to discuss politics, and in order to be able to discuss politics, elements of music can fit into that as well. So that was the, so it was never something that was so Mosiki. While it's the name is Mosiki and it's just music, um, the idea is more generally music, culture, politics, art, all this kind of stuff at the same time. Um, so the, one of the first videos we did was called uh, was a series called Angantera, which was essentially getting musicians out into an outside space where they can do a small performance. And I would just go with my camera and a mic uh, fixed to the top of the camera and I would just film them. Uh, it's a very simple series. If, ever, if any one of you have seen a takeaway show uh, by Blogotech, it's a French website. They do very similar things where they, they just film musicians in interesting places. So uh, this there's Shor Banur, who's uh, previously from the band Poor Rich Boy. So we did a, a session with him. Samin Qasim, she's been on Nescafe Basement, I think. Uh, so we did a, a session with her. We've done a, a, quite a few others. Um, then again, like I said, we, we started to branch out into more political, cultural aspects. Um, this was uh, Omer Ahmed Khwaja. He's a NCA graduate and a documentary filmmaker who makes f uh, really great films about uh, the Sikh community in Pakistan. So I went out with him to, uh, to the Gurdwara in Lahore. And we did a, a short session, and I called it Mosiki Shorts. So it's like a three to five minute documentary um, just about who he is as a filmmaker and the kind of people that he's getting in contact with and the kind of work that he's doing for the Sikh community and, and what exactly the situation is with uh, the Sikh community in Pakistan. Uh, this is Vakas Khan. He's recently, uh, he actually just texted me the other day that his work has now been accepted into the Victorian Albert Museum in London. 
or uh, he's an amazing art, miniature artist who does whose work is created by dots. And it was really amazing to go to his studio and to see how he works. And um, uh, yeah, he invited me into the studio, which I was really amazed by. And we made a short uh, documentary, four minutes, I think, about his work and about how how he makes his his pieces of art. Um, this was a video for Fake Shamans. They're a DJ duo from Lahore. Um, again, they also just texted me the other day. They're, I think they're in Cambodia doing a show now. But they were doing a, uh, the new Sweet Tooth that's opened in Andrun Lahore. They did a, a session there um, from, I think it was 2 a.m. to about 6 a.m. So it was like a sunrise show. And so they asked me to, to come and uh, document that. And that was a really amazing experience. So that, that's another thing. So I think you can see it moves, it shifts between culture, art, and lots of different things. Two countries don't necessarily hate each other, but there are reasons that are, have been made for them to hate each other. But you should definitely go and check out the video if you haven't already. But on Facebook, this, I think it recently crossed like 11 million views. Um, and that was absolutely insane for us. <laughs> I could not believe that it would get that many views. And it crossed over into India and they shared it a lot as well. So that was, you know, um, that was an amazing experience. I was, I was so happy that it actually touched people in such a way and they, were, they found it um, interesting and that Adibai was really happy as well. And the page likes just went like crazy. So I think it, before that it was like 50,000 and then it jumped up to like 150,000 from one video. Um, that, by the way, is also a worrying thing for me because that means that people just want a deal by on the, on the channel. <laughs> um, so that's why you also, then obviously there's a lot of pressure to make sure that people are, you're still giving people good content that they would not expect, but they still find interesting. Um, and of course, they're still gonna wanna hear what he has to say, but they might be also interested in, oh, there's this music stuff that's happening in Pakistan, cool. And in fact, a lot of the Indians, Indian people that uh, like the page after this have been really engaged with the content since. Uh, even Lahore musicians that are, even performance videos, they, they've been commenting and liking and stuff. And um, they're actually a very engaged audience. So I was very surprised with that. Um, yeah, challenges. Um, one of the main challenges, I think, is just the idea that we don't, as YouTubers generally, we don't really control the distribution platform that we create our content for. Uh, what I mean by that is that Facebook, Facebook can change its algorithm tomorrow and all of a sudden my videos could never get shown to half the people that I create the content for. Uh, YouTube could decide that, well, you know, five minute videos are okay, but actually we prefer 15 minute videos. And all of a sudden my videos would not get anywhere on Facebook, on YouTube. Snapchat recently, if you were invested in Snapchat and now you can see where Snapchat is just not getting any views. In the same way, maybe Instagram TV takes off tomorrow and we're all having to make vertical videos from, from tomorrow, you know? So we don't really have any control over what our content is being distributed on. And I think a lot of content creators nowadays are also just really tired because you have to create a square video for Instagram, then you have to create a widescreen video for YouTube, then you have to create a vertical thing for Instagram stories. And the, the more platforms you have, the more this kind of starts getting, like the work builds up like three times, spend a lot of time on the edit. Um, but so that can lead to some frustrations and that leads to some issues, mental breakdowns, yeah. Because yeah, like just recently I had like five, six deadlines coming in at the same time and I was like, I can't do any of this. Um, and yeah, the, I guess the final one would be content consistency as in maintaining a certain standard to the videos, um, making sure that they're all like good enough. And the same thing with the articles actually. Like I really like the, the New York Times had an initial thing which was all the news that's fit to print. And so it's sort of the same thing, right? Like would you be proud of this? Any article you write, would you be proud to see it in print or not? Is it fit to go into print? And the same with the video, would you be happy seeing it up on a big screen or not? So it's kind of difficult to maintain that consistency in social media age where, like you guys said, like it's a, a video a week or whatever is sort of the minimum. I definitely have not done a video a week. It's usually been like a video every two weeks, three weeks, whatever. Um, so yeah, I think content consistency is definitely the biggest hurdle right now, especially for YouTube where vloggers are finding a huge amount of success, which is awesome because they are able to produce content fairly quickly. 
even though I am, that's incredibly difficult as well. I'm not saying that it's not difficult, but um, for documentary stuff, it's maybe takes a little longer mm -hmm. to create. Um, and so it's really difficult to keep uploading and to keep being creative in that way. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I had for this presentation. Thanks.